Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now with Apple moving away from Intel and over to its own silicon based on the ARM architecture, it's a good time to look at the differences between ARM and x86. So if you want to find out more, please well, let me explain. Hey, to understand where we are today, it's good to look at the, some of the history of the x86 architecture and the ARM architecture. So let's quickly look at the history of x86 and Intel. Now Intel started in 1968 by Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore. That's Gordon Moore of Moore's Law. Uh, and if you'd like a video on Moore's Law, please do let me know in the comments below and I'll think about doing that. Now Intel launched its first processor in 1970, a 4-bit 4004. And then it progressed from there to the 8008, the 8080 in 72 and 74. And then here's the important one. In 1978, we had the 8086, which was the head of the 8086 family, the x86 family. That's where the x bit means there's some numbers that go before it and then 86 at the end. And it was a 16-bit CPU. That was followed by the 80186, the 80186, the 8286 in uh, 1982 and the 286 had virtual addressing which means it could do um, MMU and it could do all the virtual memory stuff and I've got videos about that on the Android Authority channel. Now of course when the 386 came out, the 80386, that was a 32-bit CPU so we've now jumped to 32 bits, it maintained the protected mode and the MMU and then really the 386 became popular in uh, IBM AT compatibles uh, compact put a 386 in their first one and from there onwards it be, kind of became the kind of the standard uh, processor for clone IBM clones to the point that Linux was developed on a 386 starting in 1991. And of course also there were clone of the chips itself so you've got the AM386 was AMD's 386 clone that was also released in 1991 and of course there's a whole story on the clones and how they came about and the lawsuits and all that kind of stuff and but that's not for this video then after the 386 of course came the 486 and after the 486 came the 586 but that was called the pentium because of uh, copyright and trademarks you it's better to trademark a, a name so we have pentium rather than 586 because these all had clones as well and then we have the Pentium Pro, the Pentium 2, the Pentium 3, that's the 686 from 95 to 97. And then finally the Pentium 4 in the year 2000. Now in 2001, Intel tried to escape from the heritage of the uh, x86 because it wanted to go to 64 bits. So it launched the Itanium, which ultimately doomed. It didn't succeed because it wasn't backwardly compatible with the x86. So in the meantime, AMD worked on the chip, the AMD 64 with its 64 bit version of x86, which it called AMD 64. And then Intel followed that up a year later with EM64T, which is Intel's version of 64 bit x86. And so together, some people like to call it AMD 64 because AMD were there first, uh, but collectively it kind of gets called x86-64 or x64. And then looking a quick bit at the history of Apple and Intel, in 2005 Apple moved from PowerPC over to the x86. In 2006 you actually get the first Macs with x86 64-bit processors in them. And then of course Intel carried on making processors. You've got the i3, the i5, the i7, the i9 from 2008 onwards. And I've got a whole video on the naming convention that Intel uses. That's also here on this channel. And then now in 2020, Apple moved from x86 64 to its own chips based on the ARM architecture. So quickly turning to ARM now, Acorn Computers was a British computer company in Cambridge established in 1978, so that was at the time that the 386 was coming out. And in the UK, it was very, very important because it was responsible for the BBC Micro, which was very, very big in education. That's the British Broadcasting Corporation. And they had BBC Micros at the schools when I was at school. And also Elite uh, was originally developed by David Braben and Ian Bell and published by Acorn Soft for the BBC Micro in 1984. Because Elite was an absolute uh, marking point, a real turning point in, in gaming back then. And of course, you've got Elite Frontiers and today and other things like that. And in 1983, Acorn started its Acorn Risk Machine project, Acorn Risk Machine ARM project, which resulted in a risk computer risk processor that would eventually become the 32-bit ARM1. Now, of course, Acorn was in Cambridge, and of course, ARM's headquarters today are still in Cambridge. 
Now to keep the cost low for the ARM one, the packaging actually around the chip was uh, made of plastic, which means that the chip had to have an under one watt power to not affect the plastic. And so the prototype chip came out in 1985. And when they got the first chip back from the manufacturer, the test board actually had a fault on it and there wasn't any power being supplied to the power rails. However, the chip still booted up and ran just from the leakage for connected to the other pins. And so actually they found out that it really didn't require much power designed to run at one watt but actually the average chip ran at under 100 milliwatts during its typical usage. Then the ARM2 came out in 1987 and the first consumer-based computer with an ARM chip was the Acorn uh, Archimedes. Now in 1986, Apple began using ARM processors for the R&D of what would eventually become the Newton. Of course, that was a commercial failure. However, ARM and Apple are now working together. And ultimately, uh, Advanced Risk Machines Limited, ARM, is spun off from Acorn in 1991 with some investment from Apple and from VLSI. At this point, it now transforms itself into an intellectual property IP company selling the designs rather than actual chips itself. Now, along the way, ARM licensed its tech to lots and lots of companies, including to digital equipment corporation DEC, and DEC, of course, brought us Ethernet, the PDP-11, VAX, and the 64-bit Alpha chip. And DEC made what was called the Strong Arm, which ran at 233 megahertz and only drew one watt of power. And this was in 1995. Now, I was working for DEC at that time, and I was actually involved in some of the projects that were looking at how to use the Strong Arm processor in different products and things that we were thinking about. Now, the Strong Arm Design Center was led by, now I'm going to get the name wrong, pronounce it wrong, Dan Doberpool. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. And that's an important name to remember for a little later. Unfortunately, DEC gave the Strong Arm technology to Intel as part of a lawsuit settlement in 1997. I remember coming into work on that day and being told that all work on the Strong Arm project was stopping because it had been given to Intel. And Intel, in fact, used the strong arm to supplement its i960 line of processors and later developed its own high-performance ARM-based implementation named Xscale, which it sold to Marvel in 2006. In fact, Intel still holds an ARM v6 architectural license, which it retained when it sold Xscale to Marvel. By 2002, ARM's partners had shipped over a billion ARM-based chips, and that number reached 50 billion in 2014. So Apple and ARM have a long relationship and in 2001 Apple launched the iPod using an ARM 7T chip. So remember we had the ARM 1 chip and the ARM 2 chip, this is the ARM 7 chip effectively and by then the ARM architecture had gone through to its fourth variation. And then the iPhone was launched in 2007 using an ARM 11 chip which was very popular in fact in uh, mobile phones at the time and that's based on the ARM v6 architecture which is what you get even today in the Raspberry Pi Zero so still in use today. And then iPhone 3G used the same chip in 2008 and then the iPhone 3GS used a Samsung chip which was the Cortex-A8 from ARM plus the GPU from Imagination, the Power VR. So here we are in 2009 and we've got this relationship between ARM and Apple and Power uh, VR, the Imagination. Then the iPhone 4 and the iPad uses the uh, Apple A4 which is actually now a chip, an SOC that Apple have designed, but it's still using the Cortex-A8. It's actually using a tweaked version of it, developed by Intrinsity, and of course, again, the uh, Power VR GPU. And then when we get to the iPhone 4S, we've got the Apple A5, dual-core Cortex-A9, so the CPU designed directly from Apple, and the GPU, again, from uh, Imagination. Now, back in 2008, Apple had bought PA Semi, founded by who? Well, there you go, Dan uh, Doberpool. So we see the same guy who did the uh, strong arm uh, back for deck was now had another company called Semi PA, uh, PA Semi, which he founded, and then that was bought by Apple, bringing over all the engineers, including Dan, to work on uh, SOC development for. Uh, Apple and in 2008 Apple secretly signed an architectural license with ARM so that it could design its own ARM compatible CPUs 
clean room, clean piece of paper, designed from the bottom upwards, but 100% compatible. And we see the fruits of that in 2012, so about four years, that's about right, for developing a brand new processor from, the, from nothing. The iPhone 5 features the Apple A6, which has got a custom-designed ARM V7-based dual-core CPU called Swift. For context, Qualcomm also released its custom ARM core, ARM v7 core called Crate in 2012 as well. But then the real thing that changed everything was the next generation, the A7, jumps to 64-bit and ARM v8 in 2013, and that caught everybody by surprise, Qualcomm by surprise, Samsung by surprise, uh, the whole Android market by surprise because now Apple have moved to 64 bits and it's still staying there with the uh, GPU from imagination. And then the A8 through to the A10 use successive generations of Apple CPU coupled again with the power VR GPUs. Now, in 2017, Apple and Imagination split, which caused big problems for Imagination. Imagination also went bankrupt, had to sell off some of its assets, including the MIPS CPU part of its things and some other things had to sell off uh, to stave away actual bankruptcy. But ARM today continues to license a wide range of Imagination's IP, basically because a lot of the stuff that's inside of Apple's GPU is based on Imagination's uh, intellectual property. And so the A11, the A12, and the A13 use successive generations of Apple CPU designs, plus Apple's designed, in quotes, GPU, which certainly has lots of power VR heritage. Now, the Apple A12Z is a variant of the Apple A12 with an 8-core GPU, and it's the one that's being used in the developer transition kit in the Mac Mini with 16 gigs of RAM. Of course, since then, we've got the Apple A13. And of course, what we're expecting to see this year, 2020, is the Apple A14 and maybe some variants of it for smartphones, for tablets, and for, uh, of course, for, for Macs. So now let's look at some of the differences between these two architectures and the companies behind them. Now, one big thing is Intel designs and manufactures its own chip. So as well as having lots of engineers that do design work in terms of micro architecture, how those instructions are executed in the circuitry, there's also large parts of Intel are dedicated to the manufacturing process. And it often has a culture of it's a manufacturing company. Some people even say it thinks it's a manufacturing company first and a design company second. Whereas ARM designs CPU and GPU cores doesn't make chips itself it licenses them to other companies like Qualcomm Samsung and MediaTek and they in turn actually manufacture those chips with uh, other companies like Samsung Semiconductor or TSMC now, another thing to note is that some companies have an architectural license, meaning they can design clean room ARM processors. We talked that Apple has one of those, Nvidia has one of those, Fujitsu has one of those, Samsung has one of those, and they're all allowed to design their own ARM compatible processors, but they have to be compatible and there's a licensing arrangement uh, with ARM. But of course, uh, Nvidia, Samsung, Apple, Fujitsu can use the latest things like 5 nanometer and 7 nanometer from Samsung Semiconductor and from TSMC, whereas Intel is still stuck on 10 nanometers. And this is really hurting Intel's business and is one of the reasons why uh, uh, Apple are moving away from Intel. It's stuck on 10 nanometers, but everyone else is going to be moving now to 5 nanometers, having already been through 7. And of course, AMD is using TSMC's 5 and 7 nanometer. Now, Apple could have gone to AMD, but at this point, they looked at the strength of their own silicon and decided that they could take responsibility for, for the design themselves. Now, another difference from, of course, uh, an architectural point of view is that x86-64 is CISC, Complex Instruction Set Computing. ARM is RISC, Reduced Instruction Set Computing. Now, I've got a whole video on this channel about the difference between those two, but to try and summarize it in one uh, slide, CISC tries to do more in one instruction. So it tries to be more like the software. Complex, multi-stage instructions. Make the CPU more like the software. And this comes from a historical point of view where, of course, memory was expensive. So if you could do more things in one instruction, it means you would use less memory for using up that, uh, you know, in the main memory for holding that instruction. Also, this idea that the CPU should be more like the software. So if the software had an action to do it, well, let the hardware take care of it. And this also resulted in what they call variable length instructions, which means that when you read an instruction from an Intel, you don't know whether you need one more byte or four more bytes or even 15 more bytes to find out the whole length of the whole instruction. 
Risk tries to do only one thing per instruction, very simple instructions. The idea was you could then do one instruction per cycle. And again, I have a whole video about instructions per cycle, uh, which you'll find linked to in the description below. And the instructions are fixed size. So when you read in an instruction, you know exactly how much you need, which makes it simpler design. And it's a load store architecture, which means it never works directly on memory. So you can't say add one to whatever is in, in address uh, hex 100. You have to load it in, first of all, into the register. So to add the contents, uh, to add to the contents of address hex 100 in risk, you need three instructions. Load the data from address 100 into, let's say, register R1, add one to R1, and then store R1 back into the uh, memory. Whereas in Intel, you can just say that all in one instruction, add one to whatever is in address 100, and it will do the rest for you. Now, because of that, since the Pentium Pro, x86 instructions are in fact turned into micro ops that are treated almost like risk. So a complicated instruction like add one to the contents of address 100 is actually converted into three micro ops as it goes down the super scalar pipeline, it's much easier to break it down. So the problem is that extra logic takes power and that means heat to decode and deconstruct these complicated instructions into the micro ops and the the fetcher part trying to fetch it all in the caching and all that stuff is more common the front end is more complicated on a cisc processor now there are several false assumptions that people make about arm processors arm chips aren't fast enough for the desktop but the people completely forget that ARM chips until now have been designed exclusively for mobile. So you find them in way back from to the iPod, all the way back you know, to your smartphone, to your latest Samsung, your latest Apple chip, and a typical 10th generation i5 desktop processor from Intel uses dissipates 65 watts. Where of course a typical smartphone is just five watts. So the very design of them is not to be designed with fans and a big 200 and 20 volts, 110 volts, whatever power supply. They're designed to run off the battery, three volts, two, five volts, whatever, that comes in your mobile phone, in your smartphone, and without a fan on it. Now, of course, if you start designing ARM chips using that architecture, but knowing you can stick a fan on it, knowing that you can do more things, then of course you can change the performance characteristics along with the heat characteristics. So can the chip scale? Absolutely. The easiest way to scale at the moment is to increase the core count. So a lot of uh, uh, companies that are making ARM chips, especially for servers, are just making lots and lots of ARM cores. So very good for, of course, for web applications when you've got thousands of users connecting to a web service. Uh, and then you can, of course, increase the uh, IPC, uh, but that would take a different type of microarchitecture that is allowed to work outside of a bigger thermal budget. Now, ARM doesn't make those necessarily at the moment. However, they are making R uh, ARM kind of chips for the server. Uh, and there are already ARM chips for servers like the uh, uh, Amazon Graviton. ARM have their Neoverse range of chips. And of course, Apple wouldn't commit to using its own silicon on ARM unless it know it could make the processors that would scale up. And of course, it's worth mentioning that the Japanese Fujitsu-based supercomputer has now taken the number one spot in the league of supercomputers. And of course, it's based on the ARM architecture. So can it scale up? Absolutely, it can. RISC chips can't do everything that SIS chips can. That's also another false assumption. Well, of course, that's not true. If you think about an ARM chip can run Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and all of the apps to go with them if they are, of course, compiled for them, just like an Intel chip can run all of those if they are compiled to them. And over the year, years, x86 had lots and lots of extra instructions added to it, particularly these uh, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data instruction, 3D now, MMX, SSE, all the way through to SSE4, AVX, and so on. Now, ARM chips also have uh, SIMD instructions, but not as many and not the same ones as x86. So can they do exactly the same thing? Well, no, because there's not MMX, for example, in uh, ARM chips. Can they achieve the same thing? Absolutely. And an example of that is that ARM V8 also has the scalable vector extension, which is specifically for vectorization for high performance computing. And that's what's actually used in the Fujitsu A64 FX processor, which is in that supercomputer that I showed you just a moment ago. So what's the future? Well, Intel needs to move past 10 nanometers. Intel knows that. Everybody knows that. Of course, they can't steal the technology from someone else, so they're going to have to solve their problems themselves and try to get themselves past that. When they do that, it will breathe a whole new life into Intel's 
uh, product line, but until it can do that, it's kind of stuck. And AMD will continue to benefit from the new process nodes from TSMC. Apple will develop, of course, its own silicon for laptops, for desktops, and of course, for smartphones based on the ARM architecture, continuing with the uh, devices that processors have already made. ARM will continue to release mobile CPU and GPU designs like the Cortex-A78, the Cortex-X, which will, of course, be used by Qualcomm, Samsung, MediaTek, and so on in our smartphones. And ARM will continue in the server space with its Neoverse processors, like the Neoverse N1, which is used in the Amazon Graviton 2. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video, this look at ARM versus uh, x86. If you did, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you like these kind of videos, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.